to one and all. Good morning, and a very warm welcome to Christ Church of Longboat Key. If you are visiting with us today, we are delighted to have you as one of our guests. And if you are comfortable doing so, we would love for you to stand, and I'll go around the room and just get two pieces of information from you, your name and where it is you come from. That helps us sometimes make connections with people who are uh, guests of the congregation during our worship. So if you're comfortable doing that, please stand now and just these two pieces of information, your name and where you come from. John Paul, West Virginia. My wife, Missy Paul, West, West Virginia. Welcome. Delighted to have you here. Yes, ma'am. Vinson from here in uh, Kentucky. Kentucky. Terrific. Welcome. Sir. Hey, she allowed you to speak, you know. <laughs> yes, folks. We've met me back. This is Mary, and I'm coming away from Surrey. From Surrey. Surrey in... Um, hang on. Uh, England. England. All oh, right. <laughs> yes, folks. Welcome. This is Judy, and I'm Larry Hudson. We're from Indiana. Indiana. Terrific. There may be other visitors who didn't feel like... Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. From Michigan. Terrific. I haven't got... Hi, I'm Tamika. It's all these bright lights in my eyes, I think. I'm sorry, ma'am. Yes. I say hi. I'm Tamika, and I'm from Manatee County, and I'm here with... From Manatee County. We're delighted to have you with us also. Thank Let's you. welcome these and any other visitors who may not have felt like standing. We are glad to have you with us, and we hope after service you'll find your way through to Fellowship Hall to enjoy one another and the good things that are provided for us there. You have the announcements included with the order of service for today's worship, and I draw your attention to one or two in particular. Um, two of them, uh, the wider church concerns rather than just our own congregation. Uh, you'll see on the first page of the announcements uh, reference to two offerings which Cedar Kirk that's the retreat center uh, jointly owned by Peace River Presbytery and Tampa Bay Presbytery. Um, the Presbyterian Retreat Center is holding a senior adult retreat on October 9 from 10 until 3. And then over a weekend, the 13th to the 15th of October, a silent retreat designed for people seeking space to listen to God. Uh, an opportunity to deepen one's spiritual life. The website is given on the announcements list, and uh, you can contact uh, Cedar Kirk for more information about either of those events. Next Sunday, we will be marking October 1st in a small way here at the church. Uh, Mark Huber and George Rao will be serving breakfast and hot dogs after worship uh, in Fellowship Hall, and uh, we are sure to have uh, a fun time together at that. And then, if that's not enough of German culture, on the afternoon of next Sunday at 5 p.m., Oktoberfest will be celebrated at Church of the Redeemer in downtown Sarasota with a concert of Lutheran German music performed by the combined choirs of our friends at St. Armand's uh, Key Lutheran Church and uh, the Church of the Redeemer, uh, accompanied by the first brass of Sarasota. The concert begins at 5 p.m. And then following the concert at 6 p.m. on the terrace and in the parish hall, there will be Oktoberfest food uh, provided by Geyer's German Sausage Kitchen, a Numpapa band, polka dancing, <laughs> and lots of fun. Uh, you can have tickets for the concert, you can have tickets for the Oktoberfest, or you can have tickets for both events uh, available from uh, the Church of the Redeemer office in downtown Sarasota. And then uh, an announcement that I know will please uh, many members of the congregation. A week from Wednesday, October 16, the church choir resumes rehearsals, gearing up for the coming season, and they will be in the choir stalls the Sunday following that, that's October 20. If we have anyone in the congregation, member or visitor, who is interested in uh, joining the choir 
uh, speak to Robert Romansky uh, after service today <coughs> or next Sunday, and Robert will be happy to give you more information. But even as we look forward to welcoming the choir back, we are conscious of a number of soloists, a number of musicians who have uh, led parts of the worship service uh, in the absence of the choir over the summer season. And uh, much as we appreciate the choir, we also appreciate the contribution to our worship which these members and friends have given. The other announcements are, as always, included in the bulletin, and as always, we commend them to you, inviting your participation in anything there that catches your eye. Now let's take a moment or two just to focus our minds and our hearts on the reason that has brought us together. And after a brief time for individual meditation, for private personal prayer, the service will begin with the prelude. Friends, together, let us worship God. And join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us sing before the Lord our Lord. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his
shall not want. When we're too busy for the rest that God provides, forgive us, good shepherd. When we face difficulty or danger and give in to fear, forgive us, good shepherd. When we are troubled by people, betrayed or attacked, and ignore your desire to journey with us through our lives, Forgive us, good shepherd, when we forget that nothing else will matter. When you call us to yourself in heaven, forgive us, good shepherd, forgive us for your love's sake. Amen. Friends, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we know that God has forgiven us. Glory be to God. Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. Wash me in his precious blood till 
to become the nation of Israel were still living as nomadic herdsmen moving around from place to place. They understood very clearly that a person's wealth was located in the size and the health of the flocks and the herds that they tended. And so it was natural that the image of a shepherd as a leader as a sustainer, as a provider, readily became usable to define nations' leaders. And then in time it came to be applied to God, the supreme leader of the nation. And you'll find references in the Old Testament to God as the shepherd of Israel or even simply just our shepherd. And that imagery suggested itself quite strongly to the shepherd boy David, who, as he was growing up, was given the task of looking after his father Jesse's flocks. But David did something very interesting with the metaphor, something unique in the Hebrew Scriptures. He made the metaphor personal. Not God is our shepherd simply, but God is my shepherd. He made the thing personal to him, an expression of his own faith. And as you read the psalm, you can see the way, in fact, David uses his experiences as a shepherd to express the faith that he is celebrating in God as his heavenly father. He speaks about protecting his flock, leading them to pasture, guiding them through dark and dangerous ravines. And then he adds to that his later experiences when on the run from King Saul and his jealousies, David found himself surrounded by enemies, but nonetheless guarded and protected and eventually brought securely to the throne. And this wonderful expression of his personal faith has commended itself to faithful souls across the world and across the centuries of the Judeo-Christian tradition. And in 19th century England, an Episcopalian clergyman named Henry Williams Baker wrote his own version of David's psalm and again, making it personal in some very interesting ways that gave a deeper Christian resonance to the faith that Jesus expressed. He included all of David's imageries, death's dark veil, the rod, the staff, the table, for example. But he gave them an interesting Christian twist. He began with the second word the king of love, my shepherd is, Baker wrote. And here he may well be doing something that David had intended. God was indeed the shepherd of Israel, but the king was also regarded as God's shepherd with and among the people. And so when David, as king, 
as shepherd of Israel, affirms that God is his shepherd. It's as though David were saying, God is God. I'm not. God is the leader of the people. I'm only God's second in command. And David may well have been seeking to express the idea that the authority that he possessed to rule Israel was derived from God and was subject to God's authority over him. It's as though, it's as though David were saying, God is the real king, I am not. I'm just second in command. And by putting the word king there, right at the start of his paraphrase, Baker is making that point clear for us to see. And of course, if we think about the ups and downs of David's life, the successes and the failures, the battles and the shames, his life would have been happier and his reign more successful if he'd managed always to acknowledge God as the one in charge and as he was willing to bend his wishes to what he believed were God's wishes both for him and for the people that he led. Which raises an interesting question for us. We talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. We affirm that God is our Lord. And in terms of the biblical use of the word, that really means that God is our king, God is in charge. God is in charge of our lives. But that's sometimes easier said than done. Easier acknowledged than it is actually lived out. If you are in any way like me, there are many times when you're prepared to be a Christian provided it's on your terms. You know, we'll be in church to worship provided there's nothing more pressing in our calendars that day. Of course we'll sign on and give service, but only to the projects that we like at the times that fit in our calendars. It's alarming how easy it is for the ego, for the self, to infect the life of faith and to deflect us from faithfully following in the way that God wants us to go. <coughs> Henry Nouwen, the great Catholic lecturer, writer, and spiritual director, wrote in one of his journals very personally addressing the issue which he felt was a problem for him. I love Jesus, he wrote, but I love Jesus, but I want to hold on to my own independence, even when that independence offers no real freedom. I love Jesus, but I do not want to lose the respect of my professional colleagues, even though their respect does not help me grow spiritually. I love Jesus, but I do not want to give up my writing plans, my travel plans, my speaking plans, even when these plans are more often to my glory than the glory of God. You see the challenge he feels. You can, I'm sure, translate it to your own life. A dedicated, committed Christian life is not necessarily easy, but it should be the goal to which we are always striving. Now, let me be clear. This does not mean that the Christian life is for perfect practitioners only. As always in the Christian life, the very opposite is the case. God calls us not on the basis of what we know, on the basis of what we believe, on the basis of how many answers we can give to difficult questions. God does not even love us on the basis of what we can accomplish or what we might be able to 
accomplish. God calls us out of his love and mercy and grace and seeks to lead us in his way. And that is why David sang, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Don't be put off by the fact that the version uh, Michelle read for us in worship this morning spoke about God leading David in the right paths. The meaning is the same either way, because the paths of righteousness are the right paths. But at this point, Baker did a very interesting thing with David's words, shining a Christian light on David's meaning. Baker wrote, perverse and foolish, oft I strayed, but yet in love he sought me and on his shoulders gently laid and home rejoicing brought me. David doesn't say that, but you catch the echo of the words of Jesus from the 15th chapter of Luke's gospel and the parable of the lost sheep. And when the shepherd found the sheep, he put the sheep on his shoulders and rejoicing went back to join the flock and David's life is a wonderful example of the truth that parable proclaims and it serves as a reminder that forgiveness is the gift we receive in Christ and are then called by Christ to practice with others as we pray each Sunday, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The poet Kathleen Morris has a wonderful story from her own personal life. Many years ago, she and her husband moved from New York City back to the isolated town of Lemon in South Dakota, which had been the home of Norris's grandparents. It was quite an adjustment from the bustling city to the isolated and rural Dakotas. And there she encountered all that was good, but also all that was very tiresome about small town life and sometimes small town people. In the community she encountered on several occasions a man whom she very quickly realized she was not going to like. He always seemed ill-tempered to me and also a terrible gossip, epitomizing the small-mindedness that can make small-town life such a trial. After she got settled in and found the church she wanted to belong to, she applied for membership and on a given Sunday was going to be publicly admitted to membership of her new church. She was amazed to discover that the man she really didn't like was the man the pastor asked to welcome the new members to the fellowship that day. And feeling a little uncomfortable and in an unaccustomed position, the man stood up and said simply, I'd like to welcome you to the body of Christ. Norris was amazed that given the guy she knew that he could speak like that. And she wrote, like distant thunder, the words made me more alert, attuned to further disruptions in the atmosphere. What had I gotten myself into? I was astonished to realize in that worship service that while I may never like Ed very much, I was called to love him. My own small mind had been jolted and the world seemed larger, opened in a new way. You see, to live as people who are forgiven and forgiving 
expands and enlarges the world in which we live. God's grace is amazing. And just how amazing appears in two other tweaks that Baker gave to David's song, making explicitly Christian what was implicit in David's words. Thy rod and staff, my comfort still. Where is the even greater comfort for people of faith? Thy cross before to guide me. And then the second is when David's words, my cup overflows, become, and oh, what transport of delight from thy pure chalice floweth. Chalice, the vessel we use in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And as a Christian, Baker wanted us to understand that the love of God which David had experienced and expressed in the words of the 23rd Psalm is a love which we as Christians see in even sharper relief and even closer focus on the cross of Jesus Christ. And it is on the cross of Jesus Christ that we are personally, individually assured that we are loved, just as the bread and the juice are given to our hands and we each personally partake. So we are told we are personally loved and forgiven and called and resourced and enabled. It is truly amazing what can happen when the cross is allowed to do its work. One of the great Christians of a previous era was Count Nicholas von Zinzendorf. He became a leader in the profound renewal of the Moravian movement in the 18th century. The Moravian movement was one of the, the fringe Reformation movements that focused on a very, very deep spirituality and a very strong commitment to Christian living and service. And Zinzendorf played a crucial role in bringing the Moravian movement forward after years and years of persecution. His own pilgrimage of faith, however, took on a new intensity earlier in his life. At the age of 18, sorry, age of 19, he was touring art galleries in Europe to broaden and deepen his education. And he found himself one day standing before a painting by Domenico Fetti called Ecce Homo, Latin from the Gospels for Behold the Man. And Fetti had painted a picture of Jesus wearing a crown of thorns. But Fetti wanted his painting to be more than a work of art. He wanted it to be a piece of Christian witness. And so below the painting, he had attached an inscription, which, English translation obviously, read, all this have I done for you. What are you doing for me? And in a sense, by making the concept of God as shepherd personal. That's what David is doing through the 23rd Psalm, asking that question. And as Christians, as we share in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and remember the cross and all that Jesus has done for us, the question becomes personal, very personal. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, grant that as we worship, it not be routine or empty, but rather personal and filled with awe and wonder that you have done so much for us 
and love us, your people, so dearly. Help us to love you in response, to love you in return, for your love's sake. Amen. And now let us stand together and affirm the faith we share as Christians. We're using the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed for reasons of clarity, understanding the meaning of some phrases which otherwise might have been misunderstood. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We continue our worship now as we bring our offering to God. giving God these are gifts and ask that you would bless them in your service and use them to strengthen the mission of your church in the world to the praise and the glory of your name amen
risen of the world, is host at this table. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep, invites us to come and enter the warmth of his presence, the richness of his love, and the assurance of his grace. And just as Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and wine and used them as symbols of eternal truth, so we take these elements of bread and wine and set them apart from all common use to this sacred use and mystery. And as Jesus gave thanks and blessed, let us come to God with our prayers and our thanksgiving. Let us pray. Great is your love toward us, dear God, the love that has created us and blessed us with life in this amazing world, the love which has also redeemed us and blessed us with new life, following in the way of Jesus, being forgiven and offering forgiveness, discovering the joy of Christian fellowship and the enrichment of Christian service. Thank you, loving God, for all the goodness that you pour out upon us for the living of our lives. Thank you for the joy of each new day. Thank you for the blessings we receive from those with whom we share our days. Thank you for the blessings which we ourselves are privileged to share with others in our lives. Thank you for the overarching grace which takes all that we are and all that we seek to become and weaves us into your richer, fuller purpose in the extension of your kingdom. All your blessings, loving God, find their focus on Jesus. In the generosity with which he lived his life, in the courage with which he confronted evil, in the integrity with which he proclaimed truth, and in the sacrifice by which he refused to be deflected from your way, but took upon himself the burden of human sin and the pain of human suffering, and redeemed them for our sake. For all that Jesus is and means to us. For all that Jesus represents going before us as he leads us in our lives. Accept the thanks and praise we offer. For we acknowledge that we offer praise not as we ought because of all your goodness, but as we can because at times we are short sighted, at times we are forgetful. At times, we are less than worthy of your love. And yet you love us, and let you care for us, and yet you call us to your way. Through our share in this service, through our handling of the bread and wine of this sacrament, confirm us as your own, renew us as your people, strengthen us for holy living in the way of Jesus. We offer these our prayers in Jesus' name and in Jesus' words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do this according to Christ's institution and command. We do this in remembrance of him, who on the night he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, 
and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste then, see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who find refuge in him.
Almighty God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you that we, loving you above all things, may obtain your promises which exceed all that we can ask or desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Sustained by the mercy, grace, and love of God, our Heavenly Father, go now to live the life of faith and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always.